Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to welcome you to the second session of this uh, conference on monetary policy. My name is Cornelia Holthausen. I'm a Director General of Financial Stability and Macroprudential Policy at the ECB. I'm very pleased to chair this um, session. So let me start by introducing the, the speakers, the two speakers and uh, the two discussants of this uh, session. So the first speaker will be uh, Stein van Nieuwerberg from Columbia Business School. So uh, Stein uh, works on the intersection of housing, asset pricing and macroeconomics. So he has done uh, researched uh, many different aspects of real estate markets but he also has a research agenda that focuses on government debt and fiscal policy, which will be uh, important for the conference. Here, um, he has been, um, um, uh, he started his career at New York University Stern School of Business, where he has been for 15 years and then joined Columbia Business School in 2018. And he's also a board member of the American Finance Association. Then we have Andrea Vedoli from Boston University, an associate professor of finance there, and also faculty research fellow at the MBR and research affiliate as a, at the CPR and research scholar at Norges Bank. Um, her research fields are primarily asset pricing and macroeconomics, and she's an associate editor of several distinguished finance journals. Then we would move to the second paper that will be presented by Guillermo Ordonez from the University of Pennsylvania, where he is professor of economics and finance. And also Guillermo is research associate at the NBR, um, frequent visitors of uh, Reserve Federal Reserve Banks and the Central Bank of Chile. And previously he was a faculty member at the University of Yale, is co-editor of the JET and uh, an editor at the Review of Financial of, of Economic Studies. So um, Professor Ordonez is a macroeconomist specialized on the study of banking, financial crisis, and information imperfections. And he has also focused on how information processing affects the functioning of sovereign debt auctions. And then last but not least, we have Federica Romay from the University of Oxford, who will be discussing that paper. She's associate professor at the University of Oxford, research fellow at CEPR, and a member of the editorial board of the uh, Review of Economic Studies. So welcome all four of you to this session. Um, now we can give uh, the floor to Steen to present um, his paper. And I think you have around 28 minutes. Please, Stan, the floor is yours. I understand you will share the presentation. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me at this uh, wonderful conference. Uh, glad to present uh, a new working paper in a series of, of research, as, uh, as Cornelia mentioned, on the monetary and fiscal determinants of government debt. And this is joint work with Zheng Yang Yang from Northwestern, uh, Hannah Lustig from Stanford, and Mindy Shaolin from UT Austin. So in this paper, we're going to focus on convenience yields, and we're going to focus on the Eurozone. So let me just spend 30 seconds trying, trying to motivate why we think this, this is interesting. Right? So just let's start at the start. What is the convenience yield? Well, there are certain bonds, certain sovereign bonds, where the safety and the liquidity of the government is such that investors are essentially willing to lend to those governments at, let's call it below market interest rates, at interest rates that are lower than what would be justified by the fundamentals, let's call it the fiscal fundamentals of that country. Right? So you know, that's what we think of as positive convenience yields. Now, the study of convenience yields has, for the most part, focused on the U.S. Treasury market because the U.S. government, since World War II, has been the safe haven asset par excellence, uh, and and naturally uh, the focus has been has been on on convenience yields in the Treasury market. We think that it's interesting to study uh, convenience yields in the eurozone as well. Um, you know, for two reasons. First, I'm going to try to argue and show you that there's actually a lot of variation in these convenience yields, both across countries and in the time series. And second, because there's something special about a currency union, a monetary union, where essentially because exchange rates are fixed and because uh, the countries share a risk-free uh, yield curve, we're going to see their convenience yields start to uh, play an important role as absorbers of country-specific fiscal shocks. Okay, so let me kind of give you a little bit more, um, you know, structure to think about these ideas. Right, so imagine that you know we can write down the the bond yield, the sovereign bond yield on a government, YTI, country I, as the sum of three pieces: a risk-free interest rate, a default spread, which which captures the credit risk in the sovereign, 
uh, as well as this convenience yield, which I'm going to call lambda ti. Okay, and so that lambda ti, as you can see, it shows up at a negative sign because in you know countries that have kind of this this safe haven status that earn this convenience yield, you know, they get to borrow at lower interest rates than they otherwise would. Now, what's interesting about a currency union is that the risk-free interest rate is common across the countries in that union. And so, you know, because of that, you could imagine writing down this equation for Germany, and you write this equation for another Eurozone country, let's say Belgium, and then you can write the difference between the interest rates on Belgian debt and the interest rates on German debt as, you know, essentially the difference between the default spreads between Belgium and Germany and the difference between the convenience yields. Of, of Belgium and Germany. And note that the risk-free interest rate drops out because Belgium and Germany share the same risk-free interest rate. Okay. And so now we could kind of ask how much of the variation uh, in interest rate differences between Eurozone countries, Belgium and Germany, is accounted for by you know, these convenience yield differentials versus these uh, default spread differentials, right? And so what we're gonna do in the data, and I'll, I'll give you a lot more detail as we go through this, but just kind of big picture, uh, you know, you could imagine measuring these default spread differences from uh, the, the credit default swap market and, and sort of then backing out what these convenience yield differences are by, by, by uh, you know, bringing the, the, the default part to the left-hand side and kind of calculating these convenience yield differentials as, uh, from this equation. And when you do that, what you see is that there's a lot of variation in convenience yields, both across countries and over time. And, and, and so the one thing to sort of note here is that most of these numbers on this graph are negative. And that's basically telling us that Germany is sort of the safe haven uh, country in the Eurozone and that most other countries have convenience yields that are lower than the German convenience yield, has, hence the, the negative sign. You know, you also see large variations in the time series 2011, the European debt crisis, for example, being an, an episode where these convenience yield differentials became particularly strong. So what we're going to want to do in this paper is sort of think about uh, this, this variation over time and across countries and think about what, you know, some of the determinants of this of these uh, intra eurozone convenience yield uh, convenience yields are. And to do that, we're going to write down, you know, a very simple framework to help us think about, um, you know, what, what what could be some of the fundamental drivers of convenience yields. And in particular, you know, we're going to take the as our starting point, the intertemporal government budget condition. And that budget condition is going to you know, clearly point towards the fiscal determinants of the convenience yield. And what we're going to argue is that in a currency union, these convenience yields are going to play an important role as shock absorbers, as, as absorbers of country specific fiscal shocks. Right? Um, and then I'm going to turn to the data and I'm going to try to empirically quantify this shock absorption role of the convenience yields in the Eurozone. And what I'm going to argue is that these convenience yield differences account for the bulk of the variation in Eurozone sovereign bond yields. So I think that's sort of a, an interesting and a new stylized fact. And second, you know, may, may, maybe more importantly, I'm going to show you that consistent with the model framework, the convenience yields respond to country specific fiscal news. OK, and so one of the one of the main messages of this paper is that fiscal news is an, is, a, is, is an important determinant of convenience yields uh, within the Eurozone and maybe uh, more broadly. OK, and so this why, you know, why should you care about this? Well, because, you know, essentially these convenience yields are going to have large fiscal costs for peripheral countries in the Eurozone. I think I'm going to show you kind of a simple counterfactual. I'm going to ask a simple counterfactual question, which is imagine that Italy and Portugal and Spain could all borrow at, you know, at the convenience yields of the German Bund. Right. How much more revenue would they have raised, you know, in the last 20 years sort of since the adoption of the euro? Um, you know, relative to what they actually raised in the data, if they had enjoyed these low convenience yields of, of, of uh, you know, of the German Bund. Okay, and we're going to argue that that's a substantial, a substantial amount of revenue that, in some sense, they missed, uh, you know, because you know their fiscal uh, status was not was not as strong as that of Germany. Okay, so let me begin by kind of giving you a sense of of the theoretical uh, results that that we derive. Um, and, and so, you know, the starting point of this analysis is, is a simple, uh, you know, first order condition for, for bond pricing, which basically says that, you know, if all the bonds uh, were, were purely risk free, then the price of a government bond uh, of maturity K plus one years in country I, you know, would be the expected discounted value of that same bond next year, which now has one year less 
to maturity discounted by this uh, you know, stochastic discount factor. And you can think of this as the stochastic discount factor being common to the different countries uh, in the currency union, in the monetary union. Okay, now that's sort of not what, what, what bond pricing looks like because there's these two additional sources uh, that we need to think about, the additional sources of price variation we need to think about. One is default risk, right? So there's potentially a default spread. Um, you can think of this variable chi as, as, as uh, you know, the value of the bond in the, in the case of a default. So this could be an indicator variable and then kind of there'll be a partial recovery in the case of default. And there's this um, additional term here, which is uh, this Euler equation wedge. And it's, that's, the con that's sort of our measure of the convenience yield. It tells us how much extra investors are willing to pay for the convenience of holding this bond of country I compared to other securities with the same pecuniary payoffs, right? So, and, and you know, there's been a range of explanations for, for this uh, convenience yield. This could, you know, be reflecting a liquidity premium, uh, like in the work of Amihud and Mendelssohn or Krishnamurti uh, or Longstaff could reflect a safety premium in the work of Krishnamurti and Vissing Jurgensen and Hey Krishnamurti and Milbra uh, could reflect the pledgeability of particular treasuries as collateral, for example, in the repo market, uh, or it could be compensation for some non-pecuniary quality. Um, but importantly, it's not necessarily an arbitrage opportunity um, because there's something special about this bond that people in the market value and that gets, gets priced in. So, you know, taking that, that starting point, um, th that is our starting point, what we can then do is we can write down the intertemporal government budget constraint, right? And so basically, uh, you know, we can combine all the different bonds that the government has, has outstanding of all the different maturities. Um, and, you know, we know that the government, you know, has to pay off a certain amount of debt at the beginning of the period. It needs to finance some additional uh, deficits that it runs this period. And all of that needs to be paid for by issuing new debt. Right, so that's the one period budget constraint, then you can iterate forward on this budget constraint and essentially just, uh, you know, make two assumptions. Uh, you know, first of all, you assume that there's no arbitrage, that all the bonds in the economy are priced correctly. And second, uh, you know, that um, there's a, a transversality condition that's satisfied for the debt. So that, you know, the value of debt at very far into the future converges to zero. Okay, and so under those sort of mild assumptions, what you get is that the value of all the outstanding government debt today, think of this as the valuation of the aggregate government debt portfolio. So it's basically all the different bonds, all the quantities of bonds of all the different maturities kind of times their price, where I wrote their price here as kind of reflecting risk-free discounting, uh, you know, credit risk discounting, as well as these convenience yields, and then sum it across all the different, um, all the different maturities, right? So this is sort of the government has debt of all a range of maturities outstanding. This is the market value of the entire portfolio of government debt. That market value has to equal, by the government budget constraint, has to equal the present value of all future surpluses, right? So these are the primary balances of the country, uh, tax revenues minus non-interest spending, discounted back by that same stochastic discount factor plus an additional term which reflects the present value of all we're going to call this senior rich revenue what we mean by that here in this particular context is all these convenience yields that the government is earning basically all the, all the reductions in interest rate uh, that it's receiving by nature of the fact that its debt is special okay so that's sort of the present value the government's earning this amount of convenience on this amount of outstanding debt we can sum that across all the, all the maturities and then discount that revenue back, right? And so this is sort of like the, you know, the, the starting point uh, of our analysis is basically just a government budget constraint. There's not a lot of, uh, you know, not a lot of uh, surprising, uh, you know, this is not a surprising equation. This just tells us the market value of debt uh, has to equal the present value of surpluses plus future senior revenues. Now, if exchange rates are flexible, you know, think of a country like the UK, then, um, you know, and if there's now a shock about the present value of the surplus, let's so think of this as you know, the UK government announcing a few weeks ago that it's going to permanently lower taxes, right? So that's sort of like saying the present value of the surplus is now permanently lower because we'll be running larger deficits for the foreseeable future. That's like a negative shock to the present value of the surpluses. Then that needs to get reflected in the value of the, in the market value of government debt. Right. And so in a country like the UK, this could mean that the interest rate has to go up. Okay? And that's, in fact, what we saw in the, in, the, in the UK bond market a few weeks ago. 
right? And so, you know, a country with flexible exchange and or there is going to be a depreciation of the British pound, right? So this is sort of what we saw in, in, in the markets a few weeks ago, right? So real, real exchange rate movements could, could adjust uh, to make this equation hold. Now, this becomes different in a currency union, right? In a currency union, the exchange rate and the risk the exchange rates are fixed and the risk-free interest rates are common. So now they cannot adjust in response to this country-specific fiscal moves, right? So this is sort of like, imagine Georgia Maloney is, you know, a, you know passing legislation that reduces uh, future surpluses for Italy. That's a negative shock to the present value of Italian surpluses. But now the Italian government bond interest rates, the risk-free rate cannot adjust because that's common across the Eurozone. The exchange rate cannot adjust. And so the only two things that can adjust now are uh, either the default risk of Italy or this convenience yield. Okay. And so we're going to, you know, as an empirical matter, we're going to want to ask how much of that adjustment to these country specific shocks, these country specific fiscal shocks, let's say to Italy, gets absorbed by default spreads on the Italian bond versus to convenience yields of Italian bonds. So that sort of naturally leads to this variance decomposition in the debt valuation, right? So we can kind of ask the question, imagine that D is the market value of government debt. Um, is that present value of future surpluses and seniorage revenue from the previous slide? So now we can say, you know, what, you know, how much of the variation in the market value of Italian debt that relative to some currency union average, or you could think of this as Germany instead, if you prefer, how much of that cross-sectional variation and time series variation between Italian and German or Italian and, and currency union-wide debt valuation comes from fluctuations in the relative uh, default credit spreads versus of, uh, you know, covariance of those, of those debt valuations with convenience yields, okay? With relative convenience yields between, let's say, Italy and, and Germany. Okay? And so this is a first kind of variance decomposition that we're gonna wanna look at in the data. And then the main question we want to ask is, you know, what about the fiscal determinants of these convenience yields? Right? So if there's a fiscal shock, to what extent, uh, you know, or is that, does that get reflected in, in, these, in these relative convenience yields? And for that, we're going to make one important additional assumption, which we think is kind of well-founded in the empirical literature and also in the theoretical literature, which is that there's downward sloping demand curves for safe assets, right? So in particular, what that means is that when the government issues a lot more debt, then its convenience yields are gonna to start to go down because the, the debt is not as special anymore. It's not as scarce anymore than if there was very little debt outstanding, right? And that's sort of the basic result in, in uh, you know, Krishnamurti and Vincent Jurgensen's paper, for example, which shows that if there's a lot of US treasury debt outstanding, then treasuries become less special relative to, let's say corporate bonds of, of high credit quality. So that's sort of uh, our, our, our main assumption here which is uh, saying that you know, if there's more, if the value of the debt, if there's a positive shock to the amount of debt outstanding, and then reduces uh, the convenience yields on that debt. Okay, and then we'll make one more assumption, which is uh, you know, just sort of for convenience, which is that if we think about convenience yields on bonds for different maturities, age, we're gonna assume that those are sort of all uh, equal uh, across the maturity structure. So think of this as an expectations hypothesis type of assumption for convenience yields across the term structure. But so under those two assumptions, uh, you know, what we can show is that if there's positive news uh, to, to the surplus, right? So there's, there's good news about future surpluses, then that's gonna increase the convenience yields uh, in, in that country, okay? So in other words, you know, there will be an adjustment to the convenience yield in response to positive news about future surpluses. And so this is sort of the main theoretical prediction that comes out of the model. Um, so, you know, just to kind of give that a little bit more uh, content um, and, and make, that, make that practical, we're gonna write down a simple numerical example where the government issues uh, debt. There's an exponential debt maturity structure in terms of the quantities of debt of each maturity. And then we're gonna assume that debt supply uh, follows NAR1 and uh, that this convenience yield, uh, you know, this is our assumption that convenience yields are downward sloping in, in, in debt supply. So this parameter beta is sort of this key, key parameter here, which measures how, how steeply downward sloping uh, convenience yields are in debt, right? And so then the main thought experiment is, imagine you now have a shock to surpluses, right? So there's good news about, about future surpluses. Um, then, you know, the convenience yield uh, increases initially, right? So the government needs to issue less debt than it, than, it, than it thought before, 
uh, and that initially that increases convenience yields, and then these convenience yields sort of gradually uh, come back down towards their their long run average. Right, so uh, you know in the long run, there's sort of a negative relationship between convenience yields uh, and and amount of debt, but in the short run, you can get this positive uh, relationship to emerge, which is which is sort of the one of the main uh, things we'll be testing in the data. So now let me turn to the data and to the empirical results in the paper. But so the first thing we want to show is just uh, you know to return to this uh, convenience yield uh, differential that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, and just show you how much variation there is in these convenience yields, both across countries and across time. Right. So remember, we're going to calculate these uh, relative convenience yields of each eurozone country I relative to Germany, and you know that is the sum of these. Um, credit spread differentials, as well as the uh, interest rate, the total uh, yield differentials. Okay, so we're gonna call this delta tilde minus y tilde. And so these, these and so we can measure these delta tildes from the CDS market, we can measure these yields uh, just directly from the bond market. We have data from 2002 until 2021. Um, and then we're gonna split our sample in the before 2008 and after 2008 uh, subsamples. And you can see before 2008, these convenience yield differentials are, are fairly small. They're on the order of 10 to 20 basis points. And, um, you know, there's not a whole lot of variation across countries either. Now, after 2008, there's a lot more variation across countries and the magnitude of these convenience yield differentials also becomes a lot larger. You know, somewhere between 10 basis points for a country like France to something like 60, 70, 40, 50, 60, 70 basis points for the periphery countries and the Eurozone. Okay, so then the first, um, the first question we want to ask is, uh, you know, back to our variance decomposition in, in the theoretical results, you know, how much of the variation in the market value of that in the, in, in the, in the relative uh, interest rates across countries uh, can we account for by either the, the credit spread or the convenience yield, uh, you know, differentials? And before 2007, the answer is that almost all of the variation in, in interest rates across Eurozone countries comes from this convenience yield channel. Now, remember, you know, I also showed you that there wasn't a whole lot of variation in, in interest rates uh, in that period and in convenience yield in that period. So you may say, well, there's not a whole lot to explain. So maybe this is, uh, you know, somewhat less interesting. The 2008 period, uh, after 2008 period, there's a lot more variation uh, in interest rates. There's also a lot more variation in default spreads, remember, you know, the European, the great financial crisis is part of the sample, the European debt crisis is part of the sample. So even what we're showing here in the, in the bottom panel is that even in this period, in this period of, uh, you know, the European debt crisis, even in this period, you know, more than half of the variation in interest rate differentials across Eurozone uh, sovereign bonds comes from this convenience yield uh, differential. And, and, and only 42% on average across countries comes from uh, the, the, the credit spread differentials. Okay, so the bottom line is that there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of variation uh, in interest rates that's accounted for by these differences in convenience yields. These seem to be important, uh, an important component of, of helping us understand the dynamics of interest rates in the Eurozone. So then the, you know, the most important thing we want to do in the empirical section is to establish a link between these convenience yields on the one hand and, uh, you know, the, the default risk, the fiscal, the fiscal news on the other hand. And so we're going to approach this a, a few different ways. So the first way is we're just going to look in the cross section of countries at uh, measures of fiscal conditions. So in the left panel here, I'm plotting the average deficit, government deficit to GDP ratio. And the right panel and plotting the average debt to GDP ratio. These are two different measures of fiscal conditions. And then on the vertical axis, I'm always plotting the average convenience yield in that country. Okay, relative to Germany. Okay, so by definition, Germany has a zero differential with Germany. Uh, you also see that Germany is fiscally the most sound country in the sense that it has had the lowest average deficit. It also has had a, mod a modest amount of debt. Compared to countries like Portugal, for example, or Italy or Spain, which have had much larger average deficits and higher average debt. And you see that that relationship sort of implies that, you know, a one standard deviation increase in the average uh, surplus, right? So reduce a reduction in the debt moving to the left, you know, increases that convenience yield differential with Germany by about 11 basis points, just to give you an order of magnitude. In the left panel, a one standard deviation reduction in debt, which is about a 22 percentage point, 
reduction in the debt to GDP ratio, that translates into about a seven basis point increase in the convenience yield relative to Germany. Right? So we think these are sort of reasonable uh, magnitudes, uh, but nevertheless, you know, substantial, uh, substantial uh, magnitudes. Second, we can turn to the time series. Uh, you know, the results here are for the five year tenor, but, um, you know, we can look at this uh, across tenors um, as well. And so what we, sh what we show in the time series is that when there's changes in the surplus to GDP ratio, we see that, you know, those affect interest rates, of course, they also affect credit spreads, and, but they also affect convenience yields, right? So basically improvements in fiscal conditions in the time series, increases in surpluses, uh, end up increasing the convenience yield relative to Germany by, uh, you know, about 11 basis points here, okay? And so we can use these numbers to basically come up with a question of if you did a variance decomposition, how much of the variance in, in, in interest rates uh, can you, in market values of that, can you account for uh, through this convenience yield channel? And so the answer that we get from this regression is about, you know, about a third, right? So about one third of the overall movement in, in, in market valuations of debt gets accounted for through this convenience yield channel, the other two thirds gets accounted for uh, through, the, through the default channel. Okay, so that's a substantial, a substantial fraction. Now, so that was using realized surplus data. You know, you could imagine that the bond market is, is forward looking and it wants to, it, it looks at future uh, conditions, uh, future fiscal conditions. So we also collect data on from consensus economics about surplus forecasts, you know, as opposed to realized surpluses. Uh, you know, we have that for a smaller set of countries. Um, but we find the same result basically is that, you know, when there's good news about future surpluses, either in the current uh, year, sort of like the, you know, we're standing in January, we're forecasting the surpluses for the current calendar year, or for next year, the year after that, you know, we find that basically improvements in the fiscal situation lead to increases in convenience yields uh, relative to Germany. And again, here, the magnitudes are actually a little bit larger. They point to something like about 60% of the variation in, uh, in interest rate differentials being accounted for by this convenience yield channel. Okay. So then the last thing we wanna briefly talk about is, is you know, why does this matter? And, and you know, what do we, you know, what, what are the implications uh, for the Eurozone uh, from that? And right, so here we wanna do a simple counterfactual exercise. We wanna ask, you know, imagine that every time a, a Eurozone country went to the bond market in the last 20 years, imagine that every time they would have enjoyed the convenience yields of Germany instead of, the, instead of their own convenience yields that they had at that time. How much more revenue would they have been able to raise uh, on these, collectively on these bond issuances, right? And so that's gonna de depend on the issuance amount, on the duration of the bonds that they issued, and on that convenience yield differential at that time with Germany. Right? And what we find is that you know, these numbers are substantial. They can be about one to one and a half percent for some countries per year, kind of at the worst, at the worst times, like in the, in the European debt crisis. In other years are not as large, but cumulatively, they add up to a substantial amount of lost revenue. And even for countries like France, right? So cumulatively over this 20 year period, France sort of uh, you know, gives up about 1% you know, of, its, of its 2020 GDP worth of, of, of revenue from not having enjoyed the same convenience yields of Germany. For countries like Spain and, and Portugal, that number is much larger. It's something like five, 6% of 2020 GDP, right? So on average for the entire Eurozone, if you add, if you, if you add this all up, this amounts to about 2.6 percentage points of 2020 GDP, which we think is a substantial amount of revenue, right? And so we think this is interesting when you think about, for example, the you know, next generation EU bonds that started uh, trading last year. Uh, you know, those are clearly common, uh, common to the Eurozone. They are enjoying the level of convenience yields of the German, of the German Bund. And so this is, you know, our, our results are telling us that this is, you know, because they're enjoying these convenience yields, they're generating, you know, substantial additional revenue uh, relative to what would have happened if each of the countries had issued their, their own bonds. And so this is kind of an important aspect of kind of a deeper fiscal union that we think is, is kind of worth, uh, worth emphasizing. So uh, let me conclude. Um, what we try to do in this paper is to build a theoretical framework that relates convenience yields to fiscal conditions and to kind of make this point that in a currency union, the convenience yield plays this new role as a shock, ab shock absorber of country specific fiscal shocks because exchange rates and, and the risk free interest rate cannot do this adjustment. 
And empirically, uh, it turns out that, you know, even though default spreads could, could do all of the adjustment, it turns out that convenience yields, in fact, do a good chunk of the adjustment. You know, they explain a large share of the variation in bond yield differentials. They rise when there's good fiscal news. And all of this matters because it affects revenues from bond issuance, especially in peripheral countries. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Stein. So let's move uh, right away to the discussant, um, Andrea Vidolin. And uh, maybe just to say we have a Q&A just afterwards. So if you want to put in any questions into the Q&A chat, you're welcome to do so. Thank you. Yours, Andrea. Okay, um, thanks a lot to the organizer for having me discuss this um, very nice paper. Um, let me start this discussion by saying um, I think it's a very important topic um, that the authors are working on and I find it very interesting this extension to the Eurozone. Okay, so um, here's an outline. I don't want to spend a lot of time summarizing the paper, so I will have two comments. The first one is, is going to be on potential endogeneity issues when they run these regressions. And the second point is more like a philosophical point about like what's special about the EU and how should we think about the credibility of a government and how it affects convenience yields in their analysis. Okay, so let me put some context to the paper. So um, there is a very old term structure literature that tries to um, link government deficits or spending to interest rates. So there are almost these like 30 year old papers by Evans and Plosser. And usually these papers have found it very hard to establish a link between government spending and interest rates. Now what this paper does is different. So they're not going to look at interest rates themselves. They're going to look at convenience yield differentials um, between um, EU countries um, and what they argue is that they reflect um, the relative fiscal conditions of member countries. Now what is um, the convenience yield? So the convenience yield just represents how much risk adjusted return investors are willing to forego to hold bonds. So this can best be illustrated by this simple no arbitrage condition. So the no arbitrage Euler equation just tells us that um, the price of any bond with maturity um, H plus one in any country I should just be the discounted value of that bond next period where obviously now the maturity has been reduced to H. Now because they allow countries to default, think of this like Xi I to capture the potential recovery in case of default. Now, what's new in this paper is that the no arbitrage condition has this extra term, which is going to be this wedge here. And this wedge here is a function of this convenience yield, which is specific to each country and for different maturities. So in particular, this wedge is going to measure the extra safety and liquidity, which is provided by these country I bonds compared to other bonds with identical payoffs. So what's the main result? So the main result relates these convenience yields to fiscal conditions of a country. Um, Stein did an excellent job explaining this very simple um, theoretical framework. So basically they start from the intertemporal, intertemporal government budget constra um, constraint, which tells us that the market value of debt, so here you just sum up over all the bonds which got issued over different maturities, has to equal the net present value of surpluses. So this is just the nominal tax revenues of country I minus the government spending. And then because they study these convenience yield, they also add these net present values of senior re uh, revenues, which are captured by the CIs, which are these convenience yields. Now they have two assumptions to derive the main results. So the first assumption you need is that the expectation hypothesis holds for these convenience yields. And the second one is that we have a downward sloping demand function for bonds. And if you have these two assumptions, you can show that the covariance between fiscal shocks, so that will be this here plus this kappa times D, which is just these um, senior rich revenues and um, shocks in the convenience yield has to be positive. Okay, so what they do now in the paper is that they test this result here in the data. So the way they measure convenience yields is um, very simple. So you just take the difference between, say, a five-year CDS spread between country I and Germany, and you subtract the five-year yield spread between that country and Germany itself. They have three results. So what they find is that on average, convenient yield differentials are negative to Germany. They have a cross-sectional results, which um, tells us that countries with higher surpluses earn higher convenience yields. And the time series results is when a country improves its financial conditions, its convenient yield rises. 
Okay, so now let me get to my first comment, which is about the endogeneity of um, some of potential endogeneity of some of the empirical results. So again, what the authors do is that they want to show that fiscal conditions help explain the variation in convenient yield differentials across time. So the empirical design looks as follows. So changes in relative yields, changes in convenience yields, or changes in default spreads are going to be regressed on the relative change in the surplus to GDP ratio of country I. And what we are interested in is in this coefficient beta, which hopefully is going to be positive for the convenience yield, according to theory. So what they do is that they link government surplus in year T with yield and CDS data at the end of June in year T plus one. So why is that? Because while we can measure the left-hand side on a day-to-day -day basis, the right-hand side obviously is only available at the annual frequency. What they write in the paper is that in doing so, we allow six months time for the fiscal information to affect debt markets. Now, what I want to argue in my discussion is that there are potential endogeneity issues, because imagine if there's something which affects both the left-hand side and the right-hand side of this equation, it would be very hard to establish a causal relationship between surplus GDP ratios and the convenience need. Let me give you an example. So let's take spring 2020. At the time, as everyone in this audience knows, the ECB implemented um, many unconventional monetary um, pack tools, most notably this pandemic emergency pur purchase program, PEPP, which was in announced in March 2020. At the same time, or just a couple of weeks later, the EU announced a very large um, fiscal package, um, which was the EU Next Generation Fund. So we can check what happened to yield changes during these particular days. So unfortunately, I didn't have like the most recent CDS data. So what I'm going to show you here are just two day changes in, in five year um, yields for um, each of these countries relative to Germany. So as many, many papers and ECB papers have shown, on the announcement of this PEPP, we saw a large reduction in, in particular in the peripheral spreads relative to Germany in the yields. There was another announcement, which was an extension of the PEPP, again, a reduction in the yields. There was another um, German ruling which questioned the legality of the PEPP P -E -P -P because of some pro proportionality rule, which um, led to an increase in these yields. Now, if you look at the fiscal announcement, what we see here is that for each of these announcements for like this fiscal spending, which is basically an 800 billion euro um, package, which uh, goes into infrastructure, climate change and research. What you see here is that there's a large reduction and large cross-sectional difference in how these yields reacted on these announcement days. Now, why do we care about that? Well, of course, we can all agree that changes in yields and hence changes in convenience yields probably happen for many reasons. What I'm showing you here is that unconventional monetary policy probably had the largest effect on yield, these yield spreads during that period. And there's a very nice ECB working paper by Corradin, Grimm and Schwab, which shows exactly that. So they, they also decompose the sovereign yield spread into convenience yield, liquidity premium and other things. And they show that this has had a very large effect at the time. What I also want to argue is that it's not just country level fiscal announcements which matter, it's also EU wide fiscal announcements which matter. And why is that? Because there's a clear risk sharing motive which argues that fiscal risk is removed from weak countries such as Italy and Spain and moved on to sh shared budgets. And I will um, mention this um, again in my later slides. So perhaps it's hard to disentangle the effects and establish a causal relationship between fiscal shocks and convenience yields if we are at this very low frequency. Now, what can we do? Now, of course, there's a very old literature that tries to identify fiscal shocks using a narrative approach or vector autoregressions, but Fortunately, we didn't have any wars in the Eurozone in the last 20 years, so this is not something that we can do to study um, fiscal shocks in the, in the Eurozone. So what we can do is that we can just do what people do in the monetary policy literature and look, for example, at fiscal announcements, um, dates, and, hap and see what happens. So as I showed you in the previous table, there was a large cross-sectional difference um, in how these yields reacted to EU-wide fiscal spending packages. Now, there's an EC be working paper of many, many authors, which argues that in particular Italy and Spain, um, their debt to GDP ratio will decrease by 10 percentage points by 2031. 
And then, of course, we can also, following the authors, we can also look at country level fiscal spending announcements. However, I will probably distinguish between budget improving and budget worsening announcement. Just to give you one example, in September 2018, when um, the Italy's ruling coalition um, announced that the deficit is going to be 2.4% instead of a decline of 0.8%, what you saw is that there was a huge increase in the Italian spread relative um, to Germany, whereas there was no movement in the other spreads because of um, this um, basically budget worsening announcement. Okay, so this was my first comment. Now, the second and comment is... Sorry, we are running a bit out of time, so if you could try to be a bit faster on the second one. Yeah, okay, so the second comment is about the credibility of a government. So the EU is going to be special, I want to argue, um, and not just any cross-section, because we have very specific rules on how um, debt and, and spending has to be in EU countries. Now, of course, we know that many countries actually are not compliant with these rules. So, for example, only 50% on average are actually actually compliant with these rules. So what I want to argue is that it really matters um, what the credibility of a government is and what they, what they announce what the budget is going to be. So here I just have very quickly two, two different examples. So Salvini mentioned that, um, that they're going to keep the budget, which led to a large decrease in the spread. However, when Mario Draghi was making a similar announcement and he basically called the EU fiscal rules obsolete, what you saw was that there was no change in the yield spread relative to Germany, even though um, basically it was like it was bad news in, in terms of like the deficit that people were expecting. So let me just summarize. So my second point is just going to be um, the EU is special because member countries spending and deficit cannot like just be any number imaginable. And I think the market takes this into account when they like try and how bonds are priced in the market itself. Um, so let me conclude. So my first comment is um, uh, we, perhaps we can think about more carefully um, about what, what should be an exogenous shock when we study fiscal shocks on yields or um, convenience yields. And then the other thing is that obviously there's a large political component when we think about surplus to GDP ratios. Um, let me conclude by saying I think this is um, a brilliant paper. It's a very important agenda and had a lot of fun and I actually learned a lot reading that paper. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrea. And before giving back the floor to you, Stine, let me just read the two um, questions that we have in the chat, and then you can um, reply to all of them together. One is by Philip Hartmann, and it makes a reference to a ECB working paper published in May 21 by Koradin and others, and that looks at euro area sovereign bond risk premier during that pandemic. Uh, and it shows a more granular composition of sovereign yields, including the convenience yield premium, this measure is conditional not only on default risk and the risk-free rate, but also on liquidity risk and redenomination risk. Hence, could the author's measure be too broad or be biased? That's one comment, and the other one comes from Wolfgang Lemke. As a byproduct of your analysis, you would get a pure risk-free rate, say the German yield plus its estimated convenience yield, with what traded rate would that synthetic risk-free rate correlate the most? I hand back to you, Sting. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, first of all, to Andrea for, uh, you know, some wonderful comments. Um, some of these things we have thought about, I, you know, I very much uh, like the idea of looking at fiscal announcements as sort of exogenous shocks to fiscal policy. But, you know, as Andrea mentioned, uh, we would want to do this for each country. Uh, and we've sort of started working, going down this path a little bit. So you might imagine it's it's sort of tricky to you know isolate an exogenous shock to 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 each country's um, you know deficit over the over the years. But I think it's definitely doable, and it sort of takes a page from that uh, monetary policy announcements literature. So I think that's sort of a promising route to make some further progress on on this question of endogeneity. Um, you know, I also think that, uh, you know, the EU-wide fiscal announcements are definitely important. You know, we do spend a little bit of time on that kind of in the paper, which I didn't go through in the, in the presentation, thinking about, you know, there is this common component in convenience yields across countries, which is sort of the German convenience yield. And you could think about, you know, EU-wide fiscal uh, announcements moving that first principle component around, right? And so, uh, you know, that, that first principle component could sort of also capture flight to safety type of dynamics.
And we show in the paper that it is indeed correlated with global stock market volatility or with US Treasury convenience yields, for example. Um, so that's sort of, um, you know, I think the level, the level of, of overall convenience yields in the Eurozone is presumably uh, affected by a bunch of different things, uh, like just flight to safety dynamics, but but potentially also EU-wide fiscal announcements. So separating that out is a little more, a little bit more tricky, which is sort of why we focus on the on the differential, the convenience yield differential with Germany. Um, I like your point about credibility. Uh, I think that is true. I mean, I think we could think about some of these EU, uh, some of these ECB uh, monetary policy announcements, especially uh, you know the quantitative easing programs, as sort of affecting the relative default risk in the eurozone countries. Maybe absorbing some of that relative uh, convenience, some of that relative default risk. Uh, you know, you could think of that as you know to to you know just as just as in your quote japan and uh, sorry uh, spain and, and italy might have much lower debt going forward you know in part because the ecb has sort of announced that uh you know they're not willing to tolerate large a certain am amount of, of of spreads in the in the bond yields and so that is i think an interesting uh, an interesting thing to explore some more like to what extent ecb announcements affect uh, our decomposition um you know to answer quickly to the questions that were asked um you know, I think the liquidity question in the Coradin et al. paper is a good one. Uh, you know, we think of liquidity as sort of endogenously determined uh, jointly with fiscal conditions. Uh, now, as a practical matter, in our empirical work, we do control for measures of liquidity in the bond market, like bid ask spreads, and we show that our fiscal variables survive the inclusion. But, you know, I think more broadly, we want to think about these, these things as jointly uh, determined in equilibrium. And, and and for that last question, I would say the, the OIS rate is maybe the most closely related to the, the true uh, risk-free interest rate. Thanks very much to Steen for a fascinating paper and um, Andrea for a very insightful discussion. So um, thanks very much.